So uh, today we're trying something a little different, that we are dealing with some questions. Uh, and uh, we had a total of eight questions submitted, actually had a couple more, but uh, uh, two that uh, were submitted by someone who's not here today. And you have to be here for me to answer the questions or for someone to answer them. So uh, that's uh, the case. <clears throat> so the way we're going to do this is that I will start with the first two. And then I'm dividing the rest up. Uh, the next three will go to Nathan. And the three after that are going to go to Harvey. So uh, we're sharing the load. I'm taking the two easy questions. They have the hard questions. That's how that works. And uh, obviously, by virtue of the fact that we've received the questions through the week, we've had a chance to look at and think about them. So uh, I just want you to know that whatever we come up with is the truth. And okay, so that's the right answer. Uh, so uh, anyway, of course, any time, any time you have questions, um, feel free to, to call the office or text us or whatever. And, uh, you know, we are interested to speak on topics and situations that do directly impact your life. And so uh, that's part of our ministry is to bring the word of God to you. So um, uh, so appreciated Harvey mentioning the fact that this is Memorial Day. Um, so uh, coming up tomorrow, and uh, so, uh, and I looked it up, I said, well, what exactly is that? Well, Memorial Day is an American holiday observed on the last Monday of May, honoring the men and women who died while serving in the U.S. military. Uh, it, originally, it was known as Decoration Day, as it originated in the years following, believe it or not, the Civil War. Uh, and became an official federal holiday in 1971. That's when my wife graduated from high school. So did I. <laughs> so it uh, goes back a little ways there. I'm just kind of curious if you would raise your hands if you know someone who passed away, either know about, had a personal relative, someone who passed away uh, in some kind of military service. Do we have anybody like that in this room? All right, we have several people that have had someone that you lost and and uh, that we remember today. So, um, and this, you know, we thank the Lord. We, we take a lot for granted, and these are good times for us to stop and to remember. Some people paid the ultimate price so that we have a lot of freedom in this country. Never take for granted what you have in this country. How many in this room, I'm just curious, how many in this room have actually traveled outside the United States? Can I see your hands? If you, look at that, boy. We're Americans, aren't we? <laughs> we you know, uh, so that's amazing. Because, and, and so if you've traveled outside the United States, I hope you come back and you realize, wow, this is a wonderful country. Because as much as I was raised in Australia, and that's a great country, I tell you what, you guys have got some tremendous advantages over that, over that nation as well. I tell you, I, and just can I say and speak on behalf of Australians, we love America. And, uh, and we, we should never take for granted the foolishness of thought that is going around that somehow this nation is hurting other nations is just outright foolishness and deception. And I want to tell you, I think God has blessed this country and uh, there is just some evil forces. You know, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against politicians. It's against evil forces. And we need to be faithful to share the good news of Jesus Christ in this uh, day and age. Because that's, I believe, a big part of the foundation of this country. Way more than Australia. For those of you who know about Australia, we were built on penal colonies. So we don't trace our genealogy in Australia. But you have every right to do it here in America. Uh, it's a great, great country. Well, with those thoughts in mind, would you just pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for the blessing uh, for myself and my family as we moved over here and, and how we've been blessed in this nation. And Lord, we want to take a moment and remember those people who paid the ultimate price for freedom. I know some all the way back to the First World War and then the Second. And I thank you, Lord, how you used America to help and to uh, protect even my own uh, ancestors in Australia as the uh, Japanese were coming down. I thank you, Lord, for the, the freedom we have in Christ. And I thank you for the freedom we have in this nation. And Father, as we look at the, your word now, as we open the word of God, as we look at questions that have been presented to us, we ask for clarity and 
confidence and accuracy in our pre presentation from your word. And we thank you for that now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. My first question begins with this. It says, when did the dispensation of grace begin? And the person asking the question gave me three options. Christ's birth, Christ's death, or Christ's resurrection. It's a bit like multiple choice. So I could just simply say, Christ's death, okay, that one's been answered. But I'll go forward and explain just a little bit more about uh, which one I would think. First of all, dispensationalism. What do we mean by dispensationalism? Well, it's a religious interpretive system for the Bible. It considers biblical history as divided up by God into dispensations. Actually, it's been divided up by men that have translated what they believe God or interpreted what God has done over the, uh, the history of cre since creation to the present. And, um, and the word dispensation actually appears in the King James, but it's a word uh, which basically can mean management. It doesn't necessarily mean sections of time, but it can be certainly interpreted that way. So uh, the scriptures are divided up uh, and... Uh, into the entire time from creation of Adam to the new heaven and new earth in Revelation 21. Now, there are two, two that I'm going to share with you. There's a potential of three dispensations. Uh, the first one, the first division is patriarchal. That's from all the way from Adam all the way to Moses, goes through Abraham. Then the second dispensation or period of time would be the Mosaic. When Moses came, he came with the law. And, uh, or the Jewish dispensation. The third one is very simply the Christian from the time of Jesus all the way up to the present. But another one that's quite popular is the seven dispensation theory. And uh, that goes this way. First of all, there's the period of innocence, and that's from creation to the fall in the Garden of Eden. Number two, there is the period of uh, conscience, which is from the fall to the flood, Adam to Noah. The third is authority over the earth, Noah to Babel. You remember the Tower of Babel? And, uh, and so they had control, responsibility for the earth. And then number four was the period of promise, Abraham to Moses. And then, uh, then we had the period of the law. And that's a long one from Moses, who brought in the law, the Ten Commandments, all the way up to the period of Jesus' death. And then we have the period of grace, which is the period that we are now living in. That's the period from Jesus' death all the way up to Jesus' return. He has not returned yet, no matter what other people say. Jesus is still yet to return. And then there's coming a time when Jesus does return that he'll set up the seventh dispensation, which will be his millennium. How long will the millennium be? 1,000 years. When Jesus, will, we believe, set his feet on the earth, uh, and he will set up his reign over all the nations of the earth uh, with his servants. And so uh, we're in that period of grace. So the question is, we go back to the question again, when is, did that period of grace actually begin? Was it Christ's birth, Christ's death? And, th and my conclusion, let's put it that way, be honest, is just simply at the point of his death. As, in other words, that was a definite end of the law being dominant, follow all the rules, that's the Jewish system and Judaism, and it was changed when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. When he said that, it was more than just, okay, my suffering's finished. It means that at that point, the period of law, I have now brought in the period of grace. Grace is favor, the favor of God, the gifts of God. And, uh, and it's interesting that uh, uh, even though in John 19, verse 30, they said, well, what is, uh, oh no, in John 19, 30 is where Jesus is recorded on the cross of saying, it is finished. Communion, you know that we celebrate. We don't celebrate the resurrection. We don't celebrate his birth. What do we celebrate? We celebrate his death. And so Jesus' death is so phenomenal. The cross of Jesus Christ is indeed a definite point in history where there was a change. Very, very powerful, something we want to remember over and over again, the sacrifice of God in giving His Son Jesus on the cross. And, um, and at that time also, the temple veil was torn from top to bottom. And that was, again, where we now have direct access into the presence of the Father. 
So that is my answer to that particular question. I hope that answers the person. Let's go to the next question that I have. Is having faith or belief, which the person asking the question is correct, it is um, having faith or belief considered works in itself? Um, and, and my simple answer to that is no, it is not. Faith is not a work. Even though Jesus said, when asked, what is the work of God? And Jesus said, the work of God is to believe in Jesus, the one whom God had sent. But yet we go from there in understanding the work of God and the idea of faith and works. And perhaps the classic passage, I'm just going to focus on this one, is Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. Simply it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of works. It is a gift of God. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one would boast. So basically, faith is a gift. Even that is part of grace. Your ability to believe is something you can't do because you just choose to believe. It is something that God does in us. He draws us to himself. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What is it? Is it? Just salvation? Or is it possibly faith itself is a gift? Your ability to believe is a gift from God. You can't believe just because I choose to believe. And so it goes on. Then what about works? Isn't works important? Yeah, it goes on in verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So basically, you believe, put your trust in Jesus Christ, and Works is the fruit of your faith. That's something that flows out, out of gratitude. You cannot earn your salvation. It's a gift that you receive or reject. So works are the result of true faith. So the answer to that question is having faith considered works in itself. The answer is no. I believe that works are a result of your faith. I'm going to turn this over to Nathan. Nathan, do you want the ear piece too, or are you just going to use that? Okay. Very good. This is Nathan. The next one will be Harvey. Well, Philip's question kind of helped answer my first question, so uh, I'm going to piggyback on what he said. Okay, so my first question is, what is required to be saved? If by grace, is this different than other works like trying to earn salvation, doing miracles, etc.? Okay, so I'm going to start off with a scripture. It's Romans 10, 9 through 10. And it says, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith, and are saved. Okay, so to summarize that, I would say that what saves you is faith in Jesus Christ. And I think that this is actually a step beyond just believing, um, just believing Jesus existed or something like that. It is actually placing your faith in him. So surrendering your life to Jesus. But God did all of the work because what he did on the cross with Jesus, that was all God's work, and that was not anything that we did. So, um, that Ephesians verse that he just read, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Okay, so salvation is a free gift. So, God did all the work, and then here's this gift. Now, you have a decision. So our, our part in that is to decide, do we accept this gift or not? But there's nothing that we can add to it. All, all that's left is our decision. So if you had to do something to earn this gift, like work for it or something, then it wouldn't be a free gift, right? Then you would be buying it. And that's not the way it works. It's a free gift for us. But this is where it gets tricky is when you get to the, the, the fruit and the works part. 
So there's this uh, verse that's kind of a little bit scary at first. John 15, in the parable of the vine and the branches, it says, Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Well, that sounds really frightening, right? <laughs> On first read, that looks like we have to do stuff to be saved. But I would say that fruit, if you look at Scripture, the whole body of Scripture, fruit is God's work in us. So it's still all God working through us. It's, it's not that we can do works to maintain our salvation or to keep it or to earn it. It's all God's work. Um, I would say that if someone had no love at all, um, no fruit in, in their heart, that would be kind of a red flag, like a cause for concern. But I think that would not be something that we would really need to worry about if we put our faith in Jesus. So if you think about it, God is the source of love. God is love itself. So if you're committed to him, and we're told to abide in him, if we're doing that, he is the source of love. So it's impossible that we would not grow in love or show some fruit out of that over the course of our life. So to summarize, um, to be saved, you must believe and accept Jesus into your heart. And then fruit and works are the natural result of, of Christ dwelling in us. So, I hope that made sense. That's kind of a complicated question. My second question is, we are born with a sinful nature, but by God's grace we have been given the gift of salvation through Christ and given his spirit to reside in us. Why then do I continue in habitual sin? Is the spirit not enough to overcome the flesh? Is it only lack of discipline and will on my part? So I don't know about you, but I mean, this is kind of a question that kind of comes up time to time. Why can't I stop sinning, right? Well, Paul had a battle with sin. In 2 Corinthians 12, he talks about this thorn in his flesh. So Paul was dealing with sin that he couldn't get rid of. It just kept tormenting him, right? But we know that Paul was saved. I mean, Paul wrote more books of the Bible than anyone. So we know that he has the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. Yet he's still struggling with sin. So another key thing to note is Paul didn't just embrace his sin and love it. He hated it. He wanted to be free from it. But for whatever reason... God wouldn't free him from this sin. And Paul is going to say why later on in that verse. He says, God allowed it for his purposes, and God's purpose in that was to keep him humble. So God may have various reasons for allowing us to, um, you know, not freeing us from sin. But sin is just part of our nature. And if you think about it, we wouldn't need grace at all if we could stop sinning. So I think that's important. But there is this process called sanctification. In John 17, 17, Jesus is praying before he goes to the cross. He's praying for the disciples, and he says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Well, sanctification is the process of being made holy. So he's, he's praying for us that we would become holy through God's word. Now that's a long process, and this process of sanctification, of us being made holy, is not going to be made complete until we are with Jesus. So unfortunately, we're never going to completely get rid of sin. We can be free from eternal death, the consequences of sin, and we can sin less by the power of the Spirit, but we can't completely get rid of it. So um, I'm actually trying something new with this. Instead of beating myself up whenever I sin and I can't stop, then I am just thanking God for that grace and saying thank you rather than beating myself up because I think that is the road to letting Satan torment you. So 
I hope that makes sense. Um, my, th my third question is, I claim the Bible is the word of God. What do I do when I'm supposed to live by faith, but I doubt or question the strength of my faith? All right, this is, this is a good question. I really like this one. Because I really like the story of John the Baptist when he's struggling with doubt. And if you want to look this up later, it's in Matthew chapter 11 or Luke chapter 7. So when John baptized Jesus, he recognized him as the Son of God. He says, behold the Lamb of God. So he recognizes him as the Son of God. But later, John's in prison, and he's starting to struggle with doubt. So he sends these messengers to, to Jesus to ask him if he really is the Messiah or if they should wait for someone else. Now, think about it. He met Jesus and saw him and baptized him and knew it was the Son of God. But why is he struggling with this doubt now? There might be a couple reasons. One is John's been in prison for a year. And then two, most of Israel is rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. So I could see why he might start to doubt and start to wonder. Um, but let's look at how Jesus responds. First, he doesn't scold John. And he doesn't say, just believe or just have faith. Instead, he tells these messengers to go inform John of all the miracles and all the things that they have seen. And then he gives them a big list. So what he does there is he gives these guys evidence to take back to John. He gives John reasons to believe. So there was no rebuke. Right after that, Jesus turns around to this crowd, and he begins to praise John. And he says that, like, he affirms John and says there is no one greater than John. So... I think that should give us assurance that God doesn't beat us up over our doubt. It's normal. It's human. I know that sometimes in the church it is scary to ask questions that, or express doubt, but that is a normal thing that everyone goes through. And I think that God understands our limits there. But he gives us reasons to trust him. So what do we do when we have doubt? Well, we could look at what John did here. John went to Jesus for answers. He could have done nothing. He could have, you know, not sent a messenger from prison. But he asked someone to go to Jesus and ask him. So he investigated. So in the past, I had a lot of questions and I had doubts that I didn't investigate. And those things just stewed and prompted more questions. But I didn't go looking for years, and I feel like that period of time, that did some damage to my faith. So learn from that. <laughs> Let's be like John and investigate. So I don't think God asks us to have blind faith. I think he gives us evidence. I think he gives us reasons and assurance. So one thing you might do is you know, go through scripture or um, make lists of evidence for your faith when you're struggling with doubt. Because I make one of those in my head, and then as I think through those pieces of evidence that God has given me one by one, I'm like, yeah, it's pretty hard to tear this down. And you can be sure. He gives us reasons to trust him. So a summary. It's normal to have doubt sometimes. Even John the Baptist, who Jesus said there is none greater than, had doubt. And to investigate it. You know, search through scripture, you know, study apologetics, or talk to someone, go to a pastor. There are resources or people in the church who would love to help you with that. And then three, try making a list of reasons that you can trust God. So that's all I got. I'm going to pass the torch to Harvey. I was in Florida last week, so Megan's getting a lot of extra time out of me today. Hey, is this, is this mic good?
better now. Two switches. That's awesome. Boy, there's two switches. <laughs> That's good. Well, this concludes today's service. <laughs> In case no one figured it out, I'm an engineer. What's my question up there? You got one? About worry. If you're saved, when you're not supposed to be worried, but you keep worrying, isn't that a sin? Yes. And we'll say yes. About the Bible doesn't say worry is a sin. Explicitly state that. Uh, but we're going to go through a little bit of God's word and come up with it with why I say yes, it is a sin. Worry, sometimes we call it fear, sometimes anxiety. If we look at the foundation of that, sometimes it's, a, it's, it's based on a failure to trust God. A failure to recognize just how good God is. Or maybe a failure to <clears throat> truly believe what God has told us in his word. I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to... Jesus, on the summer on the mount, just to kind of set the stage. Jesus said, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. And this is when I'm going out on a limb here. Because I'm going to go look out, out the, uh, uh, the window. Is this on? There we go. And if I look out, if I pull this drape back, and that's why I said I was going out on a limb. Because usually you can come out here and you're going to see something out in the grass. I, I got one. Dave, come here. I'm a lot more interactive than those other guys. <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you see on the wire over there? A bird. A bird. That's good. Good job. Good job, Dave. Thank you. Jesus said, do not worry about your life. He said, look at the birds of the air. That bird didn't sow anything. That bird didn't reap anything. And that bird didn't store up anything in a barn. Or that bird's eaten. Our Heavenly Father is feeding that bird. And Jesus went on to say, Are you not more valuable than that bird? He said, He said, who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? And I think we all look. If we look in our medicine cabinets, we see blood pressure medicines. We see all this anxiety medicine stuff. We're more valuable to God than that bird. Worry does not improve our life. It does not lengthen our life. It cuts it short. He said, Jesus said, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worries. It's going to worry about itself. Matthew 11, I think Nathan referenced Matthew 11. Matthew 28, Jesus says, come to me all you wearied and burdened, and I will give you rest. In John 14, verse 27, Jesus said, it's a common theme here, Jesus said, if my dad told me something and I didn't do it, I was in sin. And usually punished quite severely. <laughs> but with love. Here Jesus says, John 14, 27, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, he said, I do not give to you as the, world, as the world gives. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. 
Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about anything. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace. Does anyone know when he's supposed to give us peace? At all times, God's word says. And how? It says in every way. So the Lord of peace is going to give us peace at all times and in every way. Hebrews 13, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. And 1 Peter 5, cast all your anxiety on him, him being God. Because he cares for you. He said, be self-controlled and alert. He says, your enemy, and who is our enemy? Yeah, your enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And isn't that exactly what happens when we worry ourselves sick? You always, if you talk New Testament, you always got to throw in a little Old Testament, you know, so you can go to a psalm. Everyone knows this, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. God is with us. Psalm 56, verse 3 and 4 says, When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. Who has a $100 bill out there? Anybody have a $100 bill in their pocket they want to show me? Hey, hey, hey. Can I see that? You got this. Hey, come on, man. Don't worry about that, will you? I'll get back I love you, air guys, too. <laughs> Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on our own understanding. Worry leads us astray. It allows Satan strongholds in our life. He, get, he gets a foothold in our life. When that happens, it separates us from God. And, and that is basically the definition of what sin is. It is separation from God. But, so God and Jesus have made it, made it very clear in, in God's word that they care for us, they love us, and that they, they give us peace. Yes, we all fall short of understanding and acknowledging this all the time. I can guarantee you, and I haven't asked everybody ahead of time, but I can pretty much guarantee you there's no one in this room right now that has never worried. And if I'm wrong, you can say, I've never worried. But again, there's no hand going to go up. We worry about things. Our spouses, our, our finances, our children, Paying the mortgage along with the car payments and along with the insurance and the medical bills. 
Man, we worry about it. Life is overwhelming at times. And when I say life is overwhelming at times, I say, what I really mean is life is overwhelming. Almost all the time. You can read through the Psalms and you'll find worry. Look at uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. What did all the disciples do? Why did they, why did they desert Jesus and run away? And I'm, they were afraid. They were worried what was going to happen to them. Peter, you know, upon this rock, why did he deny Christ? Why? He was afraid. He was worried what was going to happen to him. John 16, verse 33, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome this world. Jesus has overcome this world. We need not worry. The second part of that question is how do you deal with this? Because sometimes it is uncontrollable. I'm going to give you two pieces of scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. We are to take every thought captive. Take every thought captive. See if it aligns with God's word. If it doesn't, it is not of or from God. And then the second scripture about how do I deal with this because sometimes it's uncontrollable is one of probably, I, I, I almost hesitated in a way to, to bring this one up because this is one that is hard for me to, to fully grasp. And when I say it, you'll, all, you'll, say, you'll know it. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. But I can tell you as sure as I stand up here that I've been through some things in my life that, man, I just wasn't feeling like Christ Jesus was strengthening me, strengthening me enough to actually make it through. But he does amazing things. He orchestrates and weaves other people into our lives to carry us when we need carried. To build us up when we need built up. To encourage us when we need encouraged. To help strengthen our faith when, we're, when our faith is down here. You know, why are we here today? And I've said this before. Why are we here today? Some of us are here to get help. And that's cool and that's awesome and that's amazing. We're glad you're here. Some of us are here today to give help. And that's the beautiful puzzle that Jesus puts together for us. Someone is ready to give and someone is ready to get. So how do you deal with it when it seems uncontrollable? Reach out. Let other people know. Let your brothers and sisters in Christ know that you're needing some help. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's a phone call or a text away to get a whole legion of prayer warriors fighting when you need help. And then my final question. The Bible talks about the transformative power of Christ to change lives. I read his word and talk to him daily. 
But what if I do not see a transformation going on in my life? Don't look. My answer is don't look. Ask. Don't look. Ask someone. We all drive, right? Everybody in here pretty much drives, except for Mesa. Is that right? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> we all got those things. What do we call them back here? Back here and back here. What do we call those things? What's that? Oh, no. We get, no, we get rid of backseat drivers early. You, you look over there, but there's something you can't see. Blind spots. We all got blind spots. There's one thing that in this room that I guarantee you not a single one of us have ever done. We have never put our own eyes on our own faces. We have never seen our own face without looking in a the mirror. There's some things about us that we cannot see. And those are our blind spots. So if you think, man, I'm not seeing some huge transformation in my life. Ask the people around you if they're seeing a transformation in your life. And I bet you they are. I know one time, for instance, that there was a, there was a, a, a man here at church. He was the last one to come in the door, and he was the first one to leave. Good guy. How, when, how long ago was that when we did... Uh, Fall Festival. We did that for a couple years, right? How long ago was that? Three or, four years. Three or four years ago. So this was, I don't remember if it was the first one or the second one. So three or four years ago, I was standing out here on the, on the walkway as we were, you know, loud music was going on and all this crazy stuff and kids playing a game. And this guy comes walking up the, the parking lot. And I knew him. I've been going to church here for 20 years. I knew exactly who he was. And he walked up and introduced himself like he, he had no idea who I was. You know, I can tell you, he probably doesn't even remember that. I can tell you something else too. Today, that same guy is usually the first or one of the first three or four guys here in the morning on a Sunday morning. And he's usually one of the last ones to leave. And usually in tow with him are a bunch of little munchkins who we are trying to impart Christ's love onto them so that they may inherit the kingdom, the, the, the everlasting kingdom of heaven through Christ Jesus. So if you don't think there's a transformation going on in your life, Ask the people around you. I know I'm a much different man than I was 20 years ago. Because again, man, that God, God does just crazy things. Again, that, that weaving and that orchestrating of people into our lives to pour themselves out into our life to make me a better man. He gave me my wife who... Without her, I can't even imagine where I would be standing this day. I can guarantee you probably one thing. It probably wouldn't be up here. And don't ask her, do not ask her exactly how transformed I have become. <laughs> you, you can't believe everything she says, you know. <laughs> she, so be careful. So if you want to know how God is working in your life and you can't see it, ask the people around because they can. They can. Praise team. Come on up. Now like Philip said, Questions, you can ask questions anytime. 
And and uh, I, I don't I don't know. That, you know, they say there's no such thing as a dumb question, but I, I like to say I believe that. But I've heard some really not not faith based ones. But I, uh, as an engineer, you know, the shop guys come in, you hear all sorts of questions, Joe. But no. As far as the questions that we address today, you know, if, if uh, Nathan and Philip, if they got any of them wrong, you can address it with them. Mine are spot on. <laughs> they have to, you know. And, uh, but it's, it's been a joy. And uh, we have a wonderful, a wonderful day to celebrate tomorrow. But before we do that, we're going to close in, in uh, um, prayer and then in, 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 in a song. And if the Lord is moving you for any reason, health, worry, anything we talked about today, anything that's on your mind, you are more than welcome. You can come forward during the song or even after the song's gone after it's done and there will be brothers and sisters the brothers and sisters I spoke about that come alongside that are orchestrated and woven into your guys's lives we will come alongside you and help you feel God's presence and pray for you and pray with you sometimes worry with you but only in little doses. Because then we're going to rest on God's word. And on his truth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just, we just thank you for, for this day. And Lord, I would pray that. If there's anyone out here who's, who's struggling. Or having difficulties. Let them know that they are loved. And you have put helpers in their way. And help them to reach out. We thank you for this beautiful day. We pray your blessings to be upon them. The families of the fallen soldiers that we honor tomorrow. We thank you for Jesus and what he has done for us. And it is in his